Hey, this is Dr. Matthews again, and we're going to talk about antimicrobial drugs. This is the last uh, talk in this series of Unit 2, and the mechanisms of antimicrobial action are just to get rid of them, kill them, or make it where they can't reproduce. A drug that kills the microbes is said to be microcidal or microbicidal. Uh, microbiostatic or just a static drug reverses growth, inhibits growth, and allows your immune system to take over. And this sounds like it wouldn't be any good, but a lot of good drugs are static as opposed to being cidal. Cidal means it kills the cell, kills the microbes. Things that can happen uh, to kill or injure cells Inhibition of wall synthesis. Destroy the peptidoglycan layer. Penicillins and cephalosporins. So since they're destroying peptidoglycans, you can imagine that these are going to be uh, more effective on gram-positive organisms. This is showing your peptidoglycan layer that you've seen pictures of before. Inhibition of protein synthesis. Some drugs may disrupt translation of at the ribosome so that the so that the organism cannot make proteins. And ribosomes of eukaryotic cells are not affected. So humans are not going to be bothered by it, but they select against bacteria. Inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis, either DNA or RNA, they can disrupt the nucleotide components, they can inhibit DNA replication or RNA transcription, it doesn't matter, whatever, the result is the same, they get rid of the bacteria and uh, make them go away. Disruption of the plasma membrane. So if we had eukaryotic organisms, many of them may be non-cell, a fungus will have a cell wall, but many are non-cell wall organisms. But if you destroyed the plasma membrane, you're going to get a lot of organisms, uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Inhibition of metabolic pathways like enzyme activity or distribution of metabolic components. Maybe they keep the organism from getting zinc or something that they need. Now, characteristics of antimicrobial actions, and we'll talk at each of these, spectrum of action, toxicity, cytal versus static, delivered to site, solubility, potency, Time it remains active and degree of resistance. Characteristics of antimicrobial agents, they complement or aid in host defense. Uh, they can cause an allergic potential. You need to be aware some drugs like penicillin is the most notorious for causing allergy. Shelf life is important. Uh, biologicals, vaccine, its shelf life is what its shelf life says, and not a day longer. Some tablets can last a lot longer than what they're labeled. They have to put a, a expiration date, but they may last longer. Affordability and availability. This is so important. If you have a drug that's going to cost fifteen thousand dollars a month, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be able to take it. I don't think my insurance is going to pay it. And if they did, the copays would be beyond my ability and anybody who's normal's ability. Okay, broad spectrum, they get a large variety of more microbes. Narrow spectrum, they may only get a few. They may not damage the normal flora, which would be good. Medium spectrums, they get some gram positives and some gram negatives, but not all. Selective toxicity, an ideal 
antimicrobial will only kill pathogens and not damage the host. You've got to look at the toxic dosage levels versus the therapeutic dosage levels. We talked about that earlier. If the LD50 is about the same thing as the therapeutic level, then that's not a good drug. Cytal versus static. Cytal drugs kill the microbes. Static drugs prevent them from growing, reproducing. Now, delivery to infection site. It's going to make a big difference in the efficacy. Barriers, body linings, blood-brain barrier. Perfect example. Just plain old procaine penicillin G, which is something you probably don't use every day, but it is used in syphilis. I think now they use benzathine penicillin, but it's the same, same difference. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's not going to have any effect on an infection that is in the brain. So if you had tertiary syphilis, it's going to take something else. Solubility, uh, are they going to dissolve enough to be concentrated enough at the site you need them? Things that go into the brain, if they're lipid soluble, they're going to go into the brain a lot better than if they're not. Time of activity, uh, if, are they going to last a long time? Are they going to, how high is the concentration going to stay high? And what about resistant populations? Now, we hope that there's not going to be any antimicrobial resistance developed from anything we do ever. But we all know that that's unfortunately not true. Uh, everything from feeding them to livestock that we eat to every time a kid sneezes, Mom runs them to the doctor. The doctor doesn't want to get yelled at for not writing something, so they write a moxicillin, and you basically breed for resistant strains. Mutations can cause uh, the resistant microbes, and then you can have acquired resistance by gene transfer, generally conjugate, conjugation, and you Remember, no doubt, everyone remembers anything I ever showed you, but that's bacteria A, that's bacteria B. They each have pili, and they exchange plasmids. And when they exchange plasmids, it kind of looks like glasses if I added some ear pieces. But anyway, it was supposed to not be. It was supposed to be conjugating bacteria. But they transfer, so you have resistance. So say if I have a lot of penicillin resistant microbes just growing in my throat, in my normal floor of throat, chances are that I'm not going to be able to, when I take another drug similar, those drugs could conjugate, I mean, those bacteria could conjugate, and the drug won't work because now I've got a new resistant drug. When the person's defense layers are compromised. You need to administer antibiotics. Now, big thing, uh, if you get a cut or uh, everything from major surgery to chainsaw injury to a prick, that thing needs to be cleaned and uh, at least treated with something. Now, never put anything in a deep wound you wouldn't put in your eye, and you'll come out okay. But small scratches, which I get almost daily between cats and weeds and bushes, I, I put a little Nesporin on because you've got, you know, I've broken the first layer of defense, which is skin. Now, we hope that we're going to give antibiotics that we're not allergic to. Always ask. Stability and shelf life. The more stable, the better. Now, these uh, mRNA vaccines have, I think, a 12-hour refrigerated shelf life after they take them out of the deep freeze. So I knew somebody was 
getting their second dose recently, and they got theirs at, say, I think, uh, 8 o'clock. Somebody came in at 8.15. Well, they had passed its shelf life. He made his by five minutes. And they're not willing to go a bit past that because if they do and then they have a breakthrough, then they'll be to blame. Affordability and availability is so important. And so many people just don't have health care. And, and that's politics. And I could get off on that bandwagon for a long time. Okay, how do you determine if something is going to be efficacious, efficacy? That's in plain English, does it work? Well, you're going to do this. This is one way of doing it. This disc diffusion method. Okay, you take the bacteria and you smear it all over these petri dishes. So you smear this all over, smear this all over, and then you put these different antibiotics, a little, this piece of paper that's just soaked in a little antibiotic. As you see, they're growing right up to this one, but this one seems to be inhibiting it some. This one is doing a good job. This one, nothing on this plate's going to work. This one is good. This one's mediocre. So you can look at these, and again, all these are is just a little piece of really thick paper or thin cardboard that has been had an antibiotic applied to it very minute amounts and uh, you can determine whether the bacteria you know a particular bacteria will respond to that antibiotic and this is done you can do this in a clinic and it is done in some clinics I mean just a, a regular doctor's office if they have a little incubator Okay, minimal inhibit inhibitory concentration method. Let me just look at this. Okay, this, and usually these are going to be read by sticking them in a computer. They have the same size of inoculum, like they've taken bacteria, sh shook it up really well, and they know they're going to put, you know, so many drops in each. And this is the time I've seen this method used, it's done all with a computerized little machine and sucks up it's a little robotic thing that sucks up a few drops of the bacteria and whatever liquid it's mixed with and it drops it into each of these jars and then they let it grow for know, a day or two and if this is the control they didn't put anything to inhibit the growth and then there's no growth here you see this is not a very good antibiotic this is a really good antibiotic for that particular bacterium what you got to think about you'd rather you know you cure a few kill a few you prefer to cure more than you kill so potential for organ damage liver damage GI damage, renal damage, cardiovascular, red bone marrow, chloramphenicol, red bone marrow. Uh, we'll come back to that. Nervous system, respiratory integument, bones and teeth, tetracycline given to children will make them have yellow looking teeth when they get their second set of teeth in. So bad drug for children. Okay. Resistance to antimicrobial drugs. Uh, we have, this just looks like we just did this, genetic and non-genetic mechanisms, mutation, that's not a uh, genetic transfer, and then genetic, genetic transfer primarily with conjugation. Okay, acquisition of drug resistance. This is actually a pretty good picture. Let's just look at this petri dish. This is a petri dish of life. The blue organisms are not resistant to the drug. Uh, the red ones, it's just a couple of little mutants in there. You'd only need one that are resistant to the drug. And you have this antibiotic in this petri dish. And the organisms continue to grow and 
several generations later, you have all resistant ones. And this is what happened. This is the, the development here is basically the evolution of your superbugs, of your drug resistant bugs. So it's not that you introduce or create a new organism. You already had a resistant mutant. You selected for it by killing off all its competition. Okay, mechanisms of drug resistance, uh, change in permeability, increased drug elimination, change in receptors, metabolic pathways, change in previously inhibited enzyme. So if all the drug did was inhibit enzyme A, the mutation may let it use enzyme B instead, or it may develop defenses against it. Now, multiple resistance, resistance to antibiotics, is a huge problem. It's a global problem. Improper prescription of prescribed, improper use of prescribed antibiotics, and the over prescription of antibiotics. Now, if a kid is sick and they have high fever and you know they have strep throat, they need antibiotics. They just do. But if they have no fever and they're really not that sick, they don't need antibiotics. It's just as simple as that. Uh, they are overprescribed. But another thing, the way people use them, they take them just for a short while. And if we went back to the other plate, they kill off, you know, just use them for a short while, and they kill off, you know, most of the bugs, but the few resistant ones stayed behind. They quit taking it after the fourth day or third day, and then all of a sudden, the ones that were resistant just really take off, and now they got a worse situation than they had to start with. Uh, the s multiple resistances are generally healthcare provider and healthcare user fault. They develop superbugs and you can get cross resistance where multiple organisms are resistant. There is definitely a factor of antibiotics in livestock. You can't leave that out in many, many states. The state of Georgia has pulled antibiotic use out of a lot of livestock. They would just give antibiotics to chickens and pigs and cows just in case they might get sick. Well, all they did was develop resistant antibiotics. Preventing drug resistance. There are a lot of things we can do. Hand washing. Hand washing helps prevent disease, therefore the need for antibiotics. Don't use antibiotics when they're not needed. Don't prescribe them when they're not needed. If you're going to use uh, antibiotics, try to find one that targets just what you have and not everything. Using drug combinations for synergistic effect. Septra is, is sep sulfamethoxazole trimethoprine. It's an old drug. It's not used much, and there's probably resistance to it. But it works so well in, well, especially horses, it just because there's not really anything all that resistant to it in horses. There's two drugs working together. Isolate facilities from ongoing, with ongoing infections. So if you have a hall that's got a bunch of people that are sick, you need to have isolation procedures in where certain people work on that hall and other people don't and also just keep up with what the current data on thinking on antibiotic resistance is. Antibiotics have to be taken as prescribed. There should not be leftover medication, but if there is, you should discard it. Don't take other people's antibiotics. This is debatable. Judiciously use antimicrobial soaps and lotions. Um, some people say that's not a good idea because you're disrupting the normal flora. 
Right now, I'm going to use hand sanitizer because I think it's more important to keep the viruses off my hands than it is to worry about the bacteria. But hand washing, again, is huge. Uh, prevent disrupting the normal flora. If you do something uh, to damage the normal flora, the classic case, taking an antibiotic that kills almost everything in your gut, it's going to make you have it's going to make you sick and you may develop resistant strains of bacteria and so therefore the whole point is to avoid selecting for resistance antibacterial agents some are natural they're synthesized by a microorganism semi-synthetic natural combined with chemicals and synthetic are strictly made in a laboratory Sulfa drugs, sulfonamides, these were the first antibiotic developed that result in metabolic disruption of bacteria. And trimethoprim is combined with the sulfonamides and you get a great synergistic effect. Quinolones, broad spectrum treatment for a variety of infections. Penicillins, this is a non-synthetic, it's actually created by a fungus. Semi-synthetic varieties, ampicillin, methicillin. Cephalosporins are structurally very similar to penicillins. They're usually well tolerated by people who have penicillin allergies, so that has been a really good thing for that. And there are several generations of them. You start off with the Keflex and it goes up from there until you have some very sophisticated drugs that kill a lot of things. Got burned out. Tetracyclines are broad spectrum antibiotics and they inhibit protein synthesis and these drugs are static. Aminoglycosides are uh, naturally produced. They're cytal. Uh, they can be very toxic, and uh, there is some resistance to some of these. Streptomycin is one of the drugs that's mentioned here. Streptomycin is really toxic, and I wouldn't use it in anything but a cow. Maybe they use it in humans, I don't know, or a topical would be okay. Macrolides. These are semi-synthetic erythromycin. It's bacteriostatic, relatively low toxicity. Chloramphenicol. This is an interesting drug. It's bacteriostatic, but it is very potent, very broad spectrum. I saw back before it was illegal, which if you look up the dates, you'll know my senior year of school when I graduated, but there was a cow lay flat out on her side. She had mastitis. She had a 105 temperature. She was pretty much dead. I mean, she looked so dead. I said, that cow is not going to live. And we gave her intravenous chloramphenicol, one dose. The next day, she was standing up eating. It is the best, the greatest, and the grandest antibiotic that kills anything and everything. Here's the rub, toxicity. And there have been people who have gotten, have used, just used chloramphenicol eye drops and developed bone marrow damage to where they had permanent aplastic anemia. So you don't want to take this unless it's, there's nothing else that will work. And I've never used it except in that one cow and then in a cat neither of which had ill effects, but uh, I talked to a physician. I said, why is it still labeled for people as toxic as it is to people? And he said, well, I've got a patient that I just did surgery on. He was a ear, nose, throat uh, specialist. He said she had infected sinuses that had, rot had rotted into her brain and she was in a coma. And he put her on chloramphenicol because she was going to die if something miraculous didn't happen. And so he removed as much dead brain and sinus and 
crud and pus as he could, intravenous chloramphenicol. Never did find out how that worked out, but chloramphenicol would be where I would want to go with that too. Bacillus antibiotics, bacitracin and polymix, and these are surface topical drugs. Um, polymix and B, bacitracin, just for little surface boo-boos. A cyclovore, these are antiviral drugs. And uh, this is less toxic than some of the other analogs. Amantadine, this is uh, for influenza A, to prevent influenza A. Uh, if it's an antiviral, I would assume this is a drug they give if you test positive for flu. Uh, I wish they gave the generic name. Well, this is the generic. I wish they gave the actual drug name. Okay, AZT, this is an AIDS drug, and it's very effective, and there are other more modern AIDS drugs that are not on this in this book. Interferons, it's just generally antiviral. Uh, what virus? All of them. No, it's just antiviral. Okay. Any fungal agents. Now we're into eukaryotic organisms, so they're closer to us, and so you've got to be careful for toxicity. Uh, there are some that are synthetic, synthetic azoles. It doesn't give you a specific drug here, but flucytosine is one for systemic infection, as well as cutaneous. Some of the natural ones, um, macrolide antibiotics, Grisia fulvin, it is for long-term skin problems. It's supposed to be good for toenail fungus, but I think it has some systemic effects, possibly some effects on male fertility. Uh, so it's one we'd think about using. I don't even know how you say that one. It's an antifungal. How about diflucan? Uh, that's a very typical uh, it's a pill that kills fungus. We use it in animals for ringworm, skin fungus, and we use it at relatively high doses, and it works great. Myconazole topicals, there are other drugs that, uh, are, that exist, they're not here though. Any protozoal drugs, chloroquine and primaquine, these are quinine derivative drugs. They're for malaria. Metronidazole, flagyl. This is what the treatment of choice for trichomonas vaginalis, trich, and giardia lamblia. Uh, this is the one you get from drinking out of a creek where animals have gone poo. Pyrithamine is another anti-malaria drug, also for toxoplasmosis. Quinine is used to treat malaria, somewhat outdated. Okay, anthelminics, helmets, these are worms. Um, an anti this should actually, anti-helminthics is the way they say it. Generally, I've seen it written without this I here. But they are uh, treating worms. Are you eukaryotic? And it says they're difficult. We do this all the time. It's not so very hard. Niclosamide, mabendazole, piprazole. These only kill round worms. Ivermectin kills a lot of stuff. Uh, the river blindness eye worm that was making a lot of people in Africa go blind. One ivermectin pill a year prevents it. I added this one in because it's just so obvious. Paranal pamoate. It's an over-the-counter pinworm treatment. It's so safe that you cannot come up with an LD50 for it. It's as much as you can give little rats uh, you know, the little lab rats, it won't kill them. The only way you can kill somebody with the parental pamoate is if you drown them in it 
or if you concentrate it down, evaporate the water off of it and give it, then it might be a high enough dose. But if your kid gets worms, don't go to the emergency room. Just go buy you eight or ten dollars worth of parental pama weight. Give it to them and they won't die. Okay, that's all for this.